Hey everybody, it's Dr. Eric Ball Cabbage. We're back for another edition of the Thyroid Answers podcast. And with me, I have um, my good friend, Dr. Kelly Haldeman. She's the author, my co-author of the book, The Thyroid Debacle. Um, she's also uh, a physician, a scientist. Uh, she's a little bit of everything. A super smart woman. And I bring her in sometimes to be act as co-host of the Thyroid Answers podcast. And today, since we are going to do a Q&A, because we got a whole bunch of questions that came in through social media and, and emails, we try to get some of these things answered. Um, I figured it would be good to bring Kelly back on because I can talk forever and Kelly can kind of rein me in at times and make sure we get the answers in a timely, all these answers in a short, timely fashion. So Kelly, welcome back. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Eric. It's great to be here. And, um, you know, I will do my best. I am not Dr. Eric Balkavich to, you know, help with the answers to some of these wonderful questions. I mean, some of these questions are questions that I have myself. So I'm not only like your co-author, but I'm your fan and I listen and I learn. And so thanks for letting me be a part of this today, Eric. Now, everybody should know that Kelly does, uh, she does a lot of what I do too. I don't think I'm the super smartest guy. And Kelly kind of talks herself down, talks me up. I think Kelly's a, a, as smart as they come. So don't feel like she doesn't know what this she's talking about. She does. She's just being, uh, she just being, what's the right word? Um, humble, right? I think well, that's the way to be, right? And I am being humble, humble, but I will say everything I've learned that is that is worth knowing and, and life-changing for, for people is from you. So, I mean, like, let's give credit where credit is due. But I mean- Right. I do have a brain. I have a couple degrees, you know, I, I, I um, will do my best, but there's a, a lot of questions where, again, when we get into them, it's like, you know, these are the, these are the answers that both practitioners and patients are looking for. And it's rooted in science. And, you know, Eric, you and I, we, one of our hobbies is to read uh, journal articles. And so in preparation, I did some, also I did some looking and some journal articles. And so I think I have some significant contributions today to today's discussion. Awesome. Well, yeah. as usual, when we do Q and A, I'm going to let you do the Q yep. and I'll start with the A and then you're going to fill in what I miss. Okay, perfect. Good. Um, and yeah, you ready? Well, let's let's do this thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, and you may or may not have already done this on your thyroid th uh, Thursday um, for your podcast. So mm -hmm. the first question here, and just defer if we need to move on, but it's can T three medication cause more uh, weight gain? Yes. So and it and that's the simple answer, yeah. short winded. And the answer is yes. And the big reason that might be, there's a couple of things that you have to take into consideration there. If you're on T3 medication, it's probably because you didn't do well on T4 only medication. And somebody said, hey, we're just going to give you T3 medication to optimize your thyroid physiology, figuring, well, if your thyroid gland's not working, it needs to make T4 and T3. And that piece is true. The thyroid gland does make some T4 and T3, but most of the T3 is made by the peripheral tissues. And when there's a cell stress response going on, it's what we talk about in the book, it's what we talk about in the podcast, cell stress, you get this adaptive downregulation of the metabolism and a reduce an adaptive downregulation or down decreased conversion of T4 to T3 peripherally, away from the brain, away from the thyroid gland. Um, and so the body's deactivating T4 and to some degree T3. So if you give more and more T3 medication that initially can make you feel a little bit better because you're giving the active hormone. But then the other thing that's starting to occur is you're suppressing T4 production. And that's going to potentially create an issue as well. And you haven't really addressed what was causing the reduced T4 to T3 conversion to begin with. So short answer, yes. Too much T3 medication uh, or inappropriate T3 medication can lead to more of the same issues you already have, and that can be a slowdown of your metabolism. My answer, what's yours? Do you have anything to add to that? I just have personal experience with this. I was on um, you know, different thyroid medications for my Hashimoto's, and some uh, pharmacists that I know, functional pharmacists, said, let's just try a combination T4, T3, and so, sure, why not? And I went on it and I felt a little bit better, but then it, it just, 
didn't, it didn't help. And I was plateauing. And I think we have a question about this, but I was actually gaining weight uh, on T3 when it was supposed to be the magical answer. So backing off of that, now we're trying to get my dose down on the T4, which is um, great. Um, it's just, it, it makes sense that you just can't pour something into the body when the body was specifically doing it for a reason, all that cell stress. It's, it's not, it, it doesn't make sense to just pour more T3 in. And so I just have personal experience with that. And so now that I'm backing down, literally like my body composition is changing. So good deal on that one. Wow. Perfect. Okay. Next question. Can a person treat their hypothyroidism naturally on their own? Like, in my opinion, if somebody's diagnosed with hypothyroidism, uh, depending on where they're at in their journey, they may or may not need some thyroid hormone if their thyroid gland has been damaged. But could they try to fix what was causing or driving the glandular or the tissue hypothyroidism on their own without that additional help of, the, I guess, a, a functional practitioner? And I would say, sure, you could. Because what we talk about in the book is hey, what are the stressors that are driving the decreased conversion of T4 to T3? What's driving the potential thyroiditis? And if you address those things, reduce the load, guess what happens? You get better T4 to T3 conversion. There's less thyroiditis. There's improved thyroid function. So absolutely, you can get there. Now, that's the reason we wrote the thyroid debacle. Because, and we didn't put a chapters with all the additional supplementation you should take on top of the too much supplementation you're already doing. Because what we felt was if people worked on the diet, the lifestyle factors, what we call the fitness factors, before they reach out to a clinician, they may help themselves. They may, they may heal themselves, right? Or... If they don't, and there's something that needs more attention, they're so far ahead by the time they get to the practitioner, we don't have to start at the fundamentals. Your thoughts? Same. I, I, I totally agree. You know, there are circumstances um, where obviously, you know, we need to work with a, a physician, you know, we, when there's, when you're, when you're very hypothyroid, right. So like, it's not, it's, it's a, it's a, um, it's a gray area too. You know, you can't just say, oh yeah, of course, you know, if your TSH is 20, you know, you, you know, you might need some intervention, of course, but really looking at, um, what causes, I just love this. I just love this so much. It's what caused your hypothyroidism? Well, let's look at that, right? Like let's address that. And you know what? It doesn't even matter if you're going to go on, really, if you're going to have to go on medication or not, you really still do need to address the foundations if you're ever going to really recover your health, because simply writing, getting a prescription for T4, um, it really doesn't uh, fix the problem. So I totally agree with you. All right, moving on. Can you ever get off a low dose of levothyroxine through lifestyle? If so, what would be the steps? I think we've already kind of talked about this one, but I'll give those answers. The steps for for the, the first part of it, can you get off levothyroxine, low dose, high dose? I think the answer is it depends on the individual and what's going on and, and what kind of work is put into the process. But I have a lot of patients that are able to reduce their dose, and I have a lot of patients that are able to eliminate their dose as we're working through the process of causes. So what would the steps B, and shameless plug about the thyroid debacle, which is follow the in initial steps in the thyroid debacle to do a self-assessment of your overall health and your life and say, okay, what's creating negative stress on my physiology and start to improve your level of fitness in all the categories Kelly and I talk about in the book. And then if you need if you still need more help, that's a great time to bring in a functional medicine practitioner to look at the things that you maybe won't be as aware of, right? And, and look at some of the things that we can test for to potentially help identify what some of those stressors are. And it is steps, right? A lot of people come into the a process, they have chronic health, they've had it for five, 10, 15 years, and they start working with a practitioner and they want it to be gone in a month, 
two months, even six months and say, I want it all to be gone. And they're, they're like, how come, um, I'm not all better yet. I, I, I mean, it's like, because it took you a long time to get this ill and this sick, and it's going to take you some time to get better, heal and improve. And healing is a process. Getting well is a process. Changing your habits and behaviors is a process. And you just have to realize that it's a constant process to be healthy, to be well. So that's my answer. Kelly. That's right. Yeah. We can't, you know, as practitioners, we can't fix your sleep schedule. We can't do that. We can't fix what you're physically putting in your mouth. We can't fix your stress level and, you know, trying to work on your respiratory fitness. Those are things you have to do. You have to do so. And I agree that that's kind of like where you start, you know, you look at all those fitness factors, you do your self-assessment, you know, yourself best. And then if you're running into things, maybe you need a, a gut test, you know, maybe you need some uh, intervention from um, a functional medicine doctor to kind of look at what the pieces that you um, are struggling with still after you've optimized everything that you possibly can. So agree. All right. Next question. Should healing thyroid be avoided in, in those foods to lower TPO, TGA, then reintroduce? Yeah. So. Sometimes these questions aren't really um, in the kings in, in the best English when they get there. But I think what this person's saying, there are foods that are associated with causing thyroid problems. And can do they need to remove those foods so that their TPO and thyroglobulin antibodies go away? And then can they reintroduce those, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a lot of nonsense. Okay, that goes on with, uh, and I, I just had a, cons a consultation with somebody who is uh, really anal about trying to do everything perfect. And so she's gluten-free and dairy-free and oxalate-free and histamine-free and a bunch of other things free. And um, she's got chronic gut issues, um, GI inflammation, thyroid issues, and she was shocked by her labs when we ran some of the, some of the testing and she's like i eat a like i've re i remove everything i've read i read everything and everybody says i have to remove all these things and i should be healthy i, I can't believe i'm like this i'm like look um some people might have gluten sensitivity and maybe some do not right some might have dairy sensitivity and some may not even if you have those things, that still might not be the thing that's driving your thyroiditis. I think that's the big mistake people make is that they think, oh, I read a blog. If you, if you are gluten, if you have a hypothyroidism, you have to be gluten-free because gluten damages the thyroid gland. And the answer is uh, no, no, it may not. And it, no, it doesn't. And maybe could the antibodies or your response to gluten potentially uh, trigger thyroiditis at the gland? Maybe, maybe, but that's not necessarily the case. Um, but I will caution everyone, and Kelly may have a different opinion on this, If you, the more restrictive you get with your diet, the more likely you are to have more food sensitivities and food intolerances and dysbiosis and permeability issues. Why? Because the issue is rare. I think it's less that the issue is the food itself. The bigger issue is the reduced digestive capacity, the incomplete digestion, the dysbiosis that occurs due to some to the certain stressors and the permeability. And then anything that you eat that doesn't get broken down appropriately, the peptides from those proteins cross the barrier, triggers an immune response. Could there be cross-reactivity with your thyroid tissue? Uh, it could be, but maybe it's just the upregulation of the nervous system and more signaling that goes on that triggers the chronic thyroiditis and the reduced conversion. But if you keep focusing on remove, 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 I don't see that as a great long-term strategy. The real issue is we got to identify which decreasing digestive capacity and we can use short-term food changes, uh, dietary changes to help kind of reduce the chaos. But I'm really cautious to say, yes, you need to remove lectins and phytic acids and 
all the nuts and all the seeds and all these things that we talk about on an anti-inflammatory paleo diet for extended periods of time, because that's going to help your thyroid gland. You can remove all those things. It doesn't help it at all. And you can remove it. And some of that can be beneficial. But if you leave and you're on a more restricted diet for an extended period of time, you're more likely to have start to have dysbiosis. And if you haven't addressed the digestive physiology in the gut and, and improved intestinal permeability, whatever you're eating more of and more limited of, you're probably going to develop more and more intolerances. Did I answer that? Right. Yeah. I think I did. Yeah. I think that's great. And I um, would say then kind of the next question has to deal with food sensitivity. So like, what if someone comes to you with a panel and it says that they're allergic to 72 things and, you know, should they then, because they have this blood work, which we could go down a rabbit hole on how unreliable food testing is in general. So I'd you know, be curious too, with your, with your answer of the food sensitivity panel, you see it, they remove everything again, like you said, maybe they feel better. Maybe now they're eating four, four foods and it's just too restrictive. So when someone comes in, how do you deal with that? I loathe food sensitivity testing, yeah, especially too. really early on in care. It doesn't mean I don't do it, but I don't typically look at food sensitivity testing because I assume anybody that has reduced stomach acid, reduced digestive enzyme capacity, reduced bile flow, permeability issues yep. mm -hmm. is going to have food reactivity to anything you eat with regular frequency. That What are we going to do? If we restrict those 73 foods, what are they going to eat more of? The things that they weren't reactive to. And then they're not going to break those down. They're going to create issues. So the biggest thing for me when somebody comes in, they have some GI irregularity. I like to change the diet a little bit. Um, I do start with a lot of people with an AIP-ish type diet, especially if they're on a standard American diet. Um, and I just, it's funny, I just had this conversation with the, the, the same person, that person I was just talking about. And I'm like, listen, uh, plant foods, and that's one of the big things that people talk about. Some of the plant foods are toxic. They have toxins in them. Plant foods eaten when they're ripe in season are digestibles. A lot of plants have things in that put some stress on the immune system of the GI tract. And that is, I think, with intention. When they're out of season, they're re much more toxic. And that tells the body, whoa, this is probably something I don't want to eat right now. It's not right. But when plants are ripe or close to ripe, they have a little bit of ear, can have a little bit of things in them that can create a little bit of stress to the, the immune system and the GI tract, but that is good. It's not bad that it does that. It's good that it does it because what it does is create what we call hormetic stress, a little bit of positive stress to the system so that we boost the stability of the system so that when it really needs to ramp up, it's, it's, str it's strong, it's regular, it's right for it. It's been challenged. To say, yep, exactly. Right? To say that all foods are bad because they have toxins in them and they create, create some stress to the system is like saying all physical exercise is bad because it breaks your muscle tissue down. True, physical activity and exercise does break muscle tissue down, but that's how you get a bigger, stronger muscle. I don't think there's anybody, well, there's some people that might argue that the best thing to do is lay on your couch because you prevent from damaging muscle tissue. But the reality is it still damage muscle tissue. So eating foods, plant, especially plant-based foods, is not harmful to you if you're eating clean, in season, primarily organic, if you can get it, you know, home raised, your own little garden if you can. But if you're eating those things, whole foods in season, they're less problematic. Now, if you're eating a lot of those foods and you already have an inflammation, then yes, we might want to pull back on those because there's plenty of inflammation and the immune system may be aggravated and we want to give the GI tract a little bit of break. So I think you can we have to just take those things into consideration. Um, any diet can change the microbiome, can create change in immune and inflammatory processes because it's a change. It could be a change that your GI tract doesn't like. It could be a change that your immune system, your GI tract does like. Um, and I don't think either one of those situations, depending on what the symptoms are like, are necessarily bad. Even sometimes, and Kelly, you can comment on that. 
when you put somebody change their diet, especially if you go from a standard diet, to, which is really hard, high carb based in many situations and low protein, and you give them more of an AIP ish, lower carb, higher protein, whole food based, people are like, I don't feel good, like in the early phases. And that's because they're used to like cheap, easy produced glucose flooding the system. And now their body's like, wait a minute, where's all my instant sh glucose, right? Where's all the stuff my bacteria was, this bad bacteria was living on. And now that bacteria starts to die off. You don't, you, your blood sugar's not regulating. Um, it's trying to change the way it's regulating. And that may not feel good for the first week or so. Exactly. Okay. This next question is really interesting. It has to do with uh, dental, dental health. And so the question is, does dental work such as getting amalgams out, drilling, um, having local anesthesia, does that affect the thyroid gland, th thyroid physiology? I, I think the answer could be yes, right? Because any stress that you put into the oral cavity could potentially trigger a little bit of inflammation, and that could be a potential short-term downregulation. If there's any dysbiosis in the GI tract, in, in the oral cavity, and if there's any damage to the mucous membranes, if there's an infection within the tooth, um, if there's any level of, you're opening up a pathway for organisms, organism toxins, just regular toxins to get into the body proper and potentially trigger a cell stress, inflammatory, and therefore a downregulation or a shift in thyroid physiology. So I said, I would say it's a problem a potential problem, but that doesn't mean because you have an amalgam that that is the cause of your health issues. I think a lot of times people are like, um, I think they go a little, they just go like, okay, I'm getting everything out. I'm pulling everything out, whether they need to or not. Um, and sometimes if that's not done well, that could also be, could be contributing to the problem. So, uh, and I think the other thing that's really important when we think about dental work is that just because you had a tooth refixed, replaced, whatever, doesn't mean that that still couldn't be the source of potential problem, even if you don't have pain. So the answer is it can, but it's a, I think it needs to be an individual situation. Yeah, I've never seen local anesthesia like, you know, lidocaine um, or any of those cause issues. Like what I've I, seen. I have not like, either. What, what you're saying is that if you've had um, a botched job or something where, you know, that that it was, um, it still could be a problem, um, such as like root canals and things. So it can still be a smoldering infection in a, in a root canal. And then also with the amalgams, I will second that if you, are aggressive. And if you don't have a dentist who does um, a biological removal, puts a dam in your mouth, protects you from the, like the getting the toxins in your body, like getting the amalgams in your body when you're doing it. I have seen people crash with that, just getting that amalgam out. They think they're doing it really well, but they didn't go to the, a good dentist or, you know, again, they did it too aggressively. So I would say with amalgams, just take it slow, find a really good dentist who's, who's done a lot of the extractions and gives you uh, the air dam and the, the, um, the source of, I think, um, the breathing apparatus, it's all different. So um, again, yes, I, I've seen people crash, but, and it can be um, a problem and other people just sail through it and, and do fine. I think the bigger issue most people need to be concerned about, especially around their oral cavity, is if you have cavities, if you have gum disease, it's a good indication that you're probably not breathing well. You're probably a bigger oral breather than a nasal breather. And that should be a red flag if you, if you have those things going. So it could be your diet, but definitely consider the fact that if you're using like a bunch of these antimicrobial mouthwashes chronically, oh, yeah. that can be a huge problem, right? If you're overly aggressive with your tooth, cleaning and picking and creating a lot of abrasions and irritation and openings that could potentially be an issue. It's also potentially a sign that the tissue is really inflamed and irritated and you probably need a less aggressive process. But yeah. if you see those things, it's, there's a lot of studies where they show 
that cavities and gum disease are highly associated with a lot of oral nighttime breathing. That's right. Yeah. And I, I don't know about you, but I judge people when I, when I'm looking at them, not judging them, getting a feel for like how they are physiologically, I will look at their gums because you can just see people when they have those inflamed red gums, it's like, Oh, that's a red flag. Like there's something going on. And I'll also add vaping. Vaping destroys your mouth, your, your flora, your microflora in your mouth. And it just can destroy your, again, your, um, your oil mucosa is just where it starts. Right. But it, all, you know, everything that's in your nasal mucosa and all that, it's all, it's really forming your micro microbiome. You're swallowing all day long. So if you're a, a vapor, time to put, put that down. Good I hope you're not a vapor. Not me. No, 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 no. I mean, people, oh, the person listen. who got, yep, you got it. Not you. Not you no. um, okay. Next question. If you take LDN, which is low dose naltrexone to decrease TPO and the uh, person writes as a last resort. Have you seen any effects on LDN lowering women's hormones, specifically estrogen? And it's, uh, I don't prescribe. So I don't, I, I don't prescribe it. I do see a lot of people come in on LDN. Um, they, a lot of them already have low estrogen. Is it the cause of low estrogen? I don't really know. So I don't have a really good answer for this question. And as Kelly knows, while I don't prescribe, you know, if you, if you feel like if somebody feels like they need LDN, I think, and it's helping them fantastic. That's great. But at the end of the day, my concern is we're taking something to potentially try and squash the immune system. And I'm always trying to figure out how can we get the immune system to be more stable without a bunch of stuff. So I'm all oftentimes looking to get people off of it because I really want to see who they are without all the stuff in them. Mm -hmm. And so that gives me a better, clearer picture. But mm -hmm. to answer this question specifically, I don't have a, an, uh, a specific answer where I see that I know for certain it creates a lot of suppression. Have you seen anything in particular? No, I haven't seen that. And I've seen a lot of people I've been working with LDN and I don't prescribe either, but uh, for probably six years, maybe more. And um, so I phoned a friend on this one. I um, asked one of my colleagues who's a functional pharmacist and does a lot of hormone testing. And she said that she has not seen that. However, I think you're right, Eric, we, you know, when we're taking LDN, it may be more, look at it more like a crutch. If you need that crutch to um, get, you know, get yourself feeling better, if it's working for you, great. But I love the, the, you know, the idea of, well, let's try and straighten out your immune system. Let's do everything you, we can for your cellular stress and then maybe back off and see how you're, how you, you're doing because maybe you, you don't need it anymore. Um, so again, I think a really good idea is if you're worried about your hormones, have go to Eric, go to some functional medicine doc to, to do a Dutch test, do a hormone test see where you're at, maybe um, work with your pr prescriber to lower it down, you know, to see where you're at, because you don't want to, um, it's almost like you're robbing Peter to pay Paul, like you're, you're taking that LDM, but then you're lowering your estrogen. So what are you going to do now? You're going to get on estrogen, <laughs> you know, it's like, you're kind of in the black hole. So um, I think, again, I think a good strategy is to work, always work on all your cellular stress, you know, work on everything you can, because, um, you know, LDM, there's, piles of studies on LDN, so many about how it modulates the immune system, but your lack of LDN did not get you into the imbalanced immune system. That's not what happened, right? So kind of keep that in mind. All right, next question. This person says, I'm on T3 only and TSH, free T4, free T3, free T3, they wrote that again, are all low. And the only symptom I have is joint pain. Normal weight, sleep is good, energy is good, circadian rhythm is looks like it's good. It says, I just can't figure out the joint pain. So can I answer this one? <laughs> you absolutely can. And I think the double free T3, I would say yeah. one of those is a reverse T3. Oh, right. Yeah, reverse T3. Well, great. Your labs are great, right? I mean, that's that's great. Um, and I'm that's great again about your symptoms. So I did a little research and you know, it looks like there's a lot of research on um, joint pain and LPS, so lipopolysaccharide. And I think Eric and I agree a lot of cellular stress comes from, again, we just talked about, about your gut. Your gut's not working. And when the gut is, um, when you have a leaky gut, dysbiosis and all of that, what can happen is that 
the um, there's an endotoxin and it's called lipopolysaccharide. And I remember hearing a story about LPS and that scientists were trying to design a compound in a lab real long time ago to disrupt every system in the body in like mouse models. They wanted to find something that would just screw up everything from head to toe. And what they actually landed on, they're like, we don't have to create anything. That entity is called lipopolysaccharide. It, it, there's studies tied to heart disease, all kinds of things. And it, or it starts in the gut. So yes, like the, all disease starts in the gut. May, they might be onto something um, when that was said years and years ago. So I think that uh, if you have all that, that is in your favor, I would, I would check into possibly being a gut issue, probably, probably maybe looking at um, again, your diet, looking at um, maybe a GI map test. So that's what I was thinking with with maybe what's the um, low hanging fruit would just be some more adjustments to how you're digesting food. Again, Eric and I are, you know, we like that whole food diet, you know, putting in, but you have to have the, the mechanisms to accept that the digestive enzymes and getting your HCL right and getting motility and your bile flow, right? So a lot of that goes in. So that would be my answer to that question. Yeah, my answer would be, along the same lines, except I, I would just go this direction. If you're on T3 only, that probably means that you didn't, you, it means you had hypothyroidism, uh, you didn't do well on T4, and probably wound up on high dose T3 to run your physiology. And so the, the immediate question to me would be, there was an inflammatory process going on, which is one of the reasons, the thing that triggered your thyroiditis, it's the thing that triggered the reduced conversion of T4 to T3, which is why you probably didn't do well on T4 only or a small amount of T3 with the T4. And that inflammation didn't go away. You're managing your some of that symptomatology with higher dose T3 because of the, and there's we won't get into the chemistry of why that can do have that uh, easier crutch effect. But if you still have joint pain, you still likely have an inflammatory process going on, which is why you don't you're on the T3 only. And I agree with Kelly. You have to start looking at what's the bigger, big drivers of inflammation in the system and dysbiosis and, and permeability and lip, lipopolysaccharides that come from oral cavity, gut cavity, a systemic infection can all be triggers. And there are things, you know, Kelly talked about that, but bacterial arthritis, you get these, there's a lot of association between lipopolysaccharides and chronic joint damage and chronic arthritic -y type conditions. So could be your problem. Not saying it be. is like there's yep. it's joint pain is multifactorial. Mm -hmm. There are multiple etiologies for for again for joint pain. So I mean, if I had to like really make that educated like guess, you know, like what could be the the big driver, um, that would be on my top. So there's you know differential diagnosis, right? And there's going to be a a lineup. And I think what Eric said is right. It's like there's something causing that that inflammatory reaction. So we got to got to figure that out. Yep. All right. Okay. So this next question says, can you talk about T2? I'm seeing a few practitioners pushing it and, um, and she wants to know more about it. Yeah. So thyroid hormone, we hear about T4, which is the, the hormone that we either take as a medication or the primary hormone that the gland makes. T4 has to be converted into T3, which is the active form. And we can that we get a small amount from the thyroid gland. The rest comes from the peripheral tissues, and we can also take that as a medication. And then T2 is one of the metabolites of T3, and there's a couple. And one has been shown to be almost like a backup to the uh, to the T3. When T3 regular conversions down, T2 is kind of one of the forms of T2 can actually support some of the mitochondrial function and some of the the cellular physiology when you have this kind of cell stress response going on. And I think a lot of the, the, the hype on T2 came from the bodybuilding world um, where there people know in that world are always looking for an advantage. And so I think that's really what really kind of started pepping this up. And now you've got practitioners that are selling this as kind of the, is their wonder thyroid supplement. And then typically you're going to find it's the same people who were saying, well, the reason people don't feel good on T4 is because the thyroid gland makes T3 and they're maybe a non-converter of T3. So we're going to give them T3. And then they, they may be the person that's on T4 and T3 or T3 only, and they still don't feel well. And so these are typically the same people that say, well, I'll give you T2. 
And T2 can help make you feel better. But ultimately, uh, it's a Band-Aid, it would be in my opinion for most things. Um, and it doesn't address the root issue. So I know people are, sell, are pushing it. I think it can temporarily make some people feel a little bit better. I get that part but I think it's a Band-Aid approach. I don't think this is a great strategy if you're seeing a functional medicine practitioner. We're just gonna give you T2. Um, and if you've been the person who's ridden the roller coaster of, I didn't do good on T4 only, I'm not doing great on T4 and T3 only, I haven't done well on T3 only, uh, is the miracle supplement gonna be T2? Uh, no. Um, it may make you feel good temporarily, but if you still have the cell stress, if you still have chronic inflammation, you're still gonna be deactivating T2 as well, and it's potentially going to create a sh short-term benefit possibly, but maybe long-term problems. Okay, next question. If you had to prescribe five must-have supplements for patients with Hashimoto's without looking at any labs, what would they be? Um, this I did do a Thyroid Thursday on because, uh, and I think, um, I think somebody, I think the way this was phrased, I took it out of this was if I had a gun put to my head, because I think the person who asked this knows I don't like to give a lot of random supplement recommendations. But um, my hierarchy would be a good digestive enzyme. Um, and why would I say that? If you, if you have a, a cell stress, tissue hypothyroidism going on, glandular hypothyroidism going on, um, you're not making a lot of digestive enzymes. I mean, your, your digestive enzyme capacity, your stomach acid capacity is going to go down. So a digestive enzyme, um, depending on the, the person with, without the addition of some betaine HCL to support stomach acid production. But if I, if you, if I, if you call me on the carpet and said just one, I would probably lean more towards the digestive enzyme versus just the HCL. That would be part one. Uh, cause the digestive enzyme is going to help you break down your proteins, break down your carbs, break down your fats, less likely to have undigested food particles, crossing the barrier, increasing immune and inflammatory process. So that would be number one. Number two would probably be, um, like an electrolyte formula because so many people who have digestive issues are losing minerals to begin with. Their fats are, are, are binding to their minerals and they're going, just, you're just pulling them right back out. Plus stress depletes some of those minerals. Uh, so that would probably be number two. Number three would be, uh, I like things to help manage the immune and inflammatory processes a bit and the antioxidant systems. And I think sulforaphane is one of the best food drivers of what we call NRF2, which is the master antioxidant, anti-inflammatory and detoxifying gene that turns on about 200 uh, enzymes, genes and enzymes that can support those systems. So I like sulforaphane, whether you get it from growing your own broccoli sprouts and eating those three to five day old broccoli sprouts, or you get it in the form of a supplement. Um, and I helped US enzymes formulate sulforazine, which is actual sulforaphane. Um, number Four would be creatine. I love creatine as a support product. Um, you need to have phosphate donors to make what we call ATP, adenosine triphosphate, which is the energy molecule. You eat food to convert food into cell energy. And to get ATP, adenosine triphosphate, you need three phosphate groups. Where do those phosphate groups come from? You use 40% of a process called methylation to make creatine, which is the storage form of phosphate for those as the phosphate donor. So my thought process in theory is if we can give somebody creatine in it when they're in a compromised state, now they have more phosphate donors in the system. They don't have to put 40% of methylation towards making it because we already gave it to them. So now you've got phosphate donors to help make a little bit more ATP. And we, they can use some of that cellular energy and that methylation due to maybe to do some other really uh, important things. And then number five would be, and it's not because uh, Kelly's here and, and she's an advisor for a, a company called Wea Water, but water, I think, is so important for healthy well-being. And 
we, I just did a podcast with Kelly and it'll be out before you, you've already heard it. If you're listening to the podcast, when you hear this one, but when we wonder that we're often getting, um, may not have the same functionality in through the process of trying to clean it and filter it and everything else. So we had that, the lat it'll, there's a podcast we just did on, on water. And we talk about how water can lose some of its functionality and we need to kind of restructure water to make it more functional and more usable. So it would be, WIO has a water bottle that helps actually helps restructure your water so it's more functional in the system. So you don't feel like you're drinking endless gallons of water, but still feel labs look dehydrated, your, your, your tissues are dehydrated, you're getting more functionality of the water. So those would be my top five. Uh, what about you, Kelly? So speaking of the real water bottle, so I'm a really big fan and always have been of molecular hydrogen. So molecular hydrogen um, is, can be found in, in nature. It, it, it really likes to diffuse quickly. So the water you're drinking, your Evian bottle, your reverse osmosis, mm -hmm. it doesn't have any molecular hydrogen. Our gut flora actually is supposed to make molecular hydrogen. What is cool about it is that it upregulates nerve too, just like that sulforazine sulforaphane is the actual you know term for that the molecule is that it goes in and it turns on all of your um, antioxidant pathways and so i think that's really a great thing to have and it's in the wheel bottle we actually produce that that molecular hydrogen and so it also has protective effects against lipopolysaccharide there's a lot of evidence that shows that lipopolysaccharide again just just think of it as a, a toxin that just circulates and it does a lot of damage Molecular hydrogen can scavenge that and it can scavenge all the free radicals. So yes, of course, that is like easy peasy. You have to drink water anyway, right? Um, so that's one of my favorites. I also love Quinton water. Um, it's really, um, especially the hypertonic, very rich in minerals. And so I've been shifting people to, from, you know, like that, what you said, electrolytes, I've been shifting people to, to using that. I think that's a really good strategy. And then one of my absolute top favorite supplements is butyrate. I just absolutely, and we're supposed to be consuming butyrate in the foods that we eat, but unfortunately we were talked out of, of how um, we're not supposed to have butter, right? So it's kind of, butter's kind of making a comeback, but butyrate is, it, it's very, um, it's, it's found a lot in butter. And so if you're eating a lot of butter, good for you, you're getting your butyrate, but butyrate can help heal the blood brain barrier. It's really protective in the gut. So that's one of my, um, my favorites. And then, like you said, just a really whole foods diet to try and get all those nutrients in a digestive enzymes important. So you can actually take that healthy food and extract what we need to extract out of it. And then sometimes you just sometimes like a good, um, multivitamin, you know, to really get that comprehensive. Um, that's, that's a nice addition too, if you need that. Perfect. I think you cheated. You went with food. I mean, that's, that would be a given and you cheated with that one. So go ahead. You go ahead. Keep, keep going. Yeah. Um, okay. And we are on, it says, you mentioned suppressing TSH is not good for your thyroid. Biotin is a B vitamin. So is it bad to use? And what about other things that suppress TSH? That's a good question. It is a good question. So is suppression of TSH good for your, not good for your thyroid? And, and I think people would have different opinions on this as the first part of the question. It all depends on what you're trying to accomplish, right? If you don't have a thyroid gland anymore, put because of surgery, radiation, destruction somehow, then you need to take enough medication, replacement medication to support what a gland would have done. And in that situation, your TSH is going to be probably suppressed a bit because you're taking medications that are going to lower the need for your body to generate its own TSH. So, um, if you're trying to get a thyroid gland to recover, I'm not a fan of suppressing TSH because I want the thyroid gland to have to do some work. That being said, biotin is a B vitamin, so is it bad to use? Uh, I don't think getting um, physiologic doses of biotin into your system is bad for your overall physiology. We've been consuming biotin for I don't know, centuries, right? It's, it's in food. 
I think the challenge when you run with biotin is more that what we do, often do with biotin is we have uh, somebody who's got a hair issue or a skin or a nail issue, and they're taking super physiologic doses, potentially a biotin to try and fix a hair issue or a skin issue with biotin when it's way more complicated than that. And, it, and it's your issue then is you're taking way too much, which may alter your blood test mm -hmm. um, when you're doing the testing. It's really interfering with the testing. Um, and, but I don't think, I'm, I'm anti super physiologic doses of almost every micronutrient, but I think the biggest issue is we have to understand what the biotin is doing. It's really influencing the testing uh, more than it is suppressing the thyroid gland. Um, and then it, what about other things that can suppress TSH? Um, well, yeah, anything that suppresses TSH could alter thyroid gland physiology a little bit. And one of the biggest things that's going to alter thyroid gland production and su suppress TSH and alter production is chronic low-grade inflammation, at least in the, or in the short run, because inflammation and that stress response is going to increase the conversion of T4 to T3 at the brain that's going to suppress TRH, which is going to suppress TSH. And that's going to suppress thyroid gland function. And then that to suppress TSH is going to lower thyroid gland fit function, which is then going to lower T4. It's going to lower T3 and then create a potential problem where not only do you have signs and symptoms, but then you also see, oh, now the thyroid gland isn't producing enough T4. And now you're going to see the, the TSH start to go back the op op opposite direction. So I think we have to take into consideration what some of these things do, i.e. biotin. Is it really suppressing the gland itself or is it interfering with the test? And then, but there's things even like metformin, which is a medication that a lot of people take who have blood glucose resistance, uh, glucose resistance, and they're taking metformin to help man lower their blood glucose. But at the same time, the metformin is suppressing TSH, which you could then reduce thyroid hormone metabolism. And I would argue if you need metformin for high blood glucose, you already have a tissue hypothyroid and inflammatory condition. So yeah, we always have to take that into consideration. Do you need the metformin? Well, I don't know. Are you doing functional medicine? No. Uh, are you changing your diet and lifestyle? No. Well, then maybe the metformin is the right strategy and you have to take into consideration that even with a low TSH in that situation, you could still be hypothyroid because the gland's not producing sufficiently. Mm -hmm. All right, next question. If natural desiccated thyroid pushes your TSH too low for you to be able to maintain a good free T3 and free T4 level, is it best to switch to T4? Um, Yes, I would say as an easy answer. So the issue is, as you are increasing, if you want to, in when you're taking a combination product at low dose, it's probably not that big of a deal. However, if you are taking, if you're, hey, hey. I lost the internet. Oh. So ask that question again, and then we'll get yep. in. We'll, we'll go. We got about another 15 minutes. Okay. If natural desiccated thyroid pushes your TSH too low for you, able to, for you to be able to maintain a good free T3 and free T4, is it best to switch to T4? So many functional medicine doctors advocate NTD, but my TSH is always suppressed on it, and I'm concerned that might be a bad thing. So I would say what happens for a lot of people is that they're, they start with T4 or maybe they start with a natural desiccated product and they don't feel well or their labs don't look as good as they want. So the thought process is I'll just give more T4 and T3 and that should work. But as you give more T4 and T3, especially as you have this cell stress inflammatory process, you're going to get an increased conversion at the hypothalamus. Uh, you're going to flood the hypothalamus, you're going to flood the pituitary with T4 and T3, and that's going to suppress TSH. And now what's going to happen is you're going to lose 
work from your thyroid gland. So now the thyroid gland is not producing T4. Now you might have, um, in time, you're going to have a drop in T4, even though you're on that. And so you're going to be like, whoa, now I, need even, now I need even more. So in this situation, if somebody's got a cell stress response on and I'm working with them to try and help them get better, I don't like them taking a combo. I like them being more on two separate medications if they really need some T3, because I want, I want those numbers to be able to be, those dosages to be able to be manipulated independently. Because if you're taking an NDT um, or you're taking armor or you're taking NP thyroid, if you increase the dose, you're increasing both. If you're dropping the dose, you're dropping both. And I, don't, and I like to have, well, I don't prescribe, my recommendation is trying to have those as two separate things. If you are not concerned or you don't have a thyroid gland or you're not concerned about your thyroid gland doing any work, then it may not matter what your TSH is as much. And maybe you can go up in the dose and that lower TSH won't matter so much. But I think the vast majority of people who have or struggle with chronic hypothyroid symptoms, they've got cell stress, they've got inflammation, they have reduced T4 to T3 conversion and taking, whether it's, any type of a desiccated product, or it's a um, really any level of thyroid hormone to drive levels up and make both free T4 and free T3 be what we want it to be, you're probably going to force the suppression of TSH and still not really feel optimal. Does that answer? How do you like your, yep. what do you think? No, I, th I totally agree. Um, next question. I'm on T3 only and my T3 level is great, but of course T4 and TSH are suppressed. My goal is to get off my medication. So is there a way to detect where inflammation is coming from? I've heard you can use LP PLA2, which is lipoprotein associated phospholipase A2, uh, oxidized LDL and C-reactive protein. Is this true? I suspect most of it's coming from EBV, Epstein-Barr virus, because my monocytes won't come down below 11 and my lymphocytes below 36. So my goal is to get off medication is a way to detect where the inflammation is coming from. Well, some of these markers are just generic markers of inflammation. Um, so they don't tell us where it's coming from. If you... Right, right. There are some inflammatory markers like alkaline FOS that we can run and we can say, okay, it's a liver, it's a gut, it's bone. Um, but a lot of the markers we look at are generic. They don't tell us exactly where, what, what tissue is problematic. That's where you need a clinician who knows how to interpret labs and say, okay, based on your signs and symptoms, based on your complaints, based on these inflammatory markers, based on the rest of the blood chemistry panel, it looks like you have a GI issue. If we saw, if we saw uh, inflammatory markers elevated and uh, white blood cell differential off, and we saw magnesium deficiency, calcium deficiency, a whole bunch of B9, B6 deficiency markers, uh, and the person's got GI symptoms, we'd probably go, hmm, maybe that inflammation is coming from the GI tract. Maybe take, it's worth taking a look at it. Um, I'll, I'll make a default, and maybe this is bad and Kelly will correct me, but a large percentage of the immune system surrounds the GI tract. So it's a good chance that if there's inflammation in your body, uh, the GI tract is probably possible source uh, to, take a, to take into consideration. Even when you look at ferritin and CRP, you know these are uh, molecules that can be generated from the liver when there's inflammatory conditions, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the liver is the problem. And many times what I've seen is that in people who have a lot of inflammation going on and compromised liver function, their CRP is really low, really low, less than measurable. And I think a big reason is, is because they don't have liver function. So they'll have um, potentially abnormally, uh, inappropriately low inflammatory markers. I've seen that, yep. Mm -hmm. Right? Right. And you're like, so, no way, there's no way this person's CRP is this. But again, it's, and I've had people come in where they're like, oh, my doctor ran a CRP and it's fine. I'm, I'm fine. You know, meanwhile, they have mm -hmm. piles of symptoms too. Right. So, so none of these, mar the, the thing with inflammatory markers is you can't run one and hang your hat on it because you right. could run one marker 
and it's net normal. And then you, if you ran the ferritin and fibrinogen and homocysteine and LP, PLA2, and you ran uh, uric acid, you might see three or four of those other markers are elevated. It's the same thing. You'll see some GI tests. If you run GI tests, you'll see some only run calprotectin. And so I've seen so many, there's other tests that'll run three inflammatory markers and other ones that'll run seven inflammatory markers. And I see, even though it's calprotectin is the kind of the most talked about GI inflammatory marker, I've seen a lot of people with normal calprotectin and five or six of the other inflammatory markers are all elevated. So you're like, eh. so I think it's individual based. The rest of that question, I think, or comment there was, I suspect it's coming from EBV because my monocytes. Well, monocytes can be high for a number of reasons. Lymphocytes can be elevated for a number of reasons. If you have EBV and you've had it before, you think you have it again and or you test it and it is elevated, my concern for you is what's causing that EBV to constantly be either latent or reactivated. That would be my concern, right? And you're going to try and treat with an anti with an antiviral. I get that. But if you've done that and it comes back or you keep doing it, my concern would be, why is it coming back? Something's up with your immune system. Something's causing tissue damage. Something is creating an environment where the virus is like, this is a cool place to hang out, right? So you can use the antiviral and maybe you'll knock it down a little bit, but you're probably going to have other organisms activated beyond just the, the EBV, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yep. I agree with that. And I think we have time for this short last question. Yep. Um, this, this person has some tightness uh, around their throat area um, and they're in some tightness around their neck and they have hypothyroidism. I think they're asking, could that be linked? Or like they're asking maybe our, just our thoughts on that. Yeah. So I, they probably have some level of thyroiditis going on. Yeah. Um, so that's inflammation, maybe developing a not nodules or a goiter. And so the tissues enlarging now what's driving it? Is it immune, inf inf immune cells infiltrating in there and creating damage? Is it iodine deficiency that would need, would need to be investigated, but something is going on. If you have high hypothyroidism, we need to investigate why that's the, why the thyroid glands enlarging. That would be the most, could it be something else? It could, but the most likely answer, if you already know you have hypothyroidism and you're getting a lot of tightness in your neck, is that you're getting some enlargement of the thyroid gland. That would be one of the first things I would consider. Yeah, and I think you'll agree that that warrants a, a trip to the allopathic doctor just to look for any, to the, you know, palpating any nodules or anything. I think that, you know, when you start to have that and it's significant enough, I would just go in and, and see what they have to say to you about the gland, gland structure itself. Yeah. It's a, I mean, anytime, if you're, if your airway is starting to be restricted, <laughs> yeah. you're getting a lot of tightness in there, you're having a hard time swallowing, uh, you need some more crisis management um, to, to find out, okay, is this a person uh, who's got something more, more sinister going on that needs some immediate acute attention? Uh, and then, at the end of the day, it's like, okay, what, what's what's the cause? But what do we what can we do to keep the person safe, right? And that's I agree with you, Kelly. That's right. So good. Okay. I think we I think we did it. We knocked yeah. out about what half of the right. list of questions I was sent. Okay, half. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So be a part two. These are really so fun. I, I really enjoy these. I enjoy listening to your your answers and for people to be so engaging. I just love that people are you know, really asking questions about their own health, like that's empowering. So this is great. Yeah. So keep the questions coming. Uh, share this one with your friends, your family, and uh, give us a little rating on uh, on your, wherever you get your podcast out at. And, um, you know, if you like having Kelly on the podcast and you want her on more, send us a message and we'll try and make sure we get her on for uh, more episodes. We have, I have had a lot of guests on, lately and um and i do like sometimes just drilling down a little bit on some of these things so the q a is good we'll have kelly come back we'll do a follow-up to this q a and uh if there's any 
topics that you want to hear on the podcast um, or people that you're looking that maybe have us interview, let us know somewhere, send us a message, comment wherever you fi- see the podcast or Instagram or social media. Like, hey, here's some guests I would love to hear you have an inter- interaction with and we'll do our best to try and get them on the podcast. So Kelly, thanks so much for doing the Q&A uh, job today. Uh, mm-hmm. You look like you're doing fantastic in your preparation for the holidays. Uh, I am. I have a uh, you know a lot of work here to do after we get off this call, but uh, it's all good. It's all good. I'm feeling amazing. So thank that's you, we, Dr. Volkavis, for for that. That's what we like to hear. And the good news is you're not you don't have to worry about no shave November for your <laughs> facial hair because because you're healthier. You're not growing a whole bunch of extra facial hair. So that's a good thing. All right. That's always a good thing. All right. Well, take care and thanks again. It was it was a great time. All right, Kelly. See ya. See ya.